Welcome back to Sledgehammer Horror, guys. I am Ken Sledge, and let's talk horror. Today, I am joined by Lana Barron and Mayran Torgoli of the film Curse of Aurora, which I'm not saying right. Sorry, anybody that's French that's or French-Canadian, I didn't mean to insult you. Uh, how are you guys doing today? Good. How are you? Doing great. I'm doing so well. Um, I'm going to start with you, Lana. Um, ladies first type of guy. Uh, Lana's an actress, producer, and screenwriter. She's best known for her work in Curse of Aurora. Um, she also co-wrote, starred, and produced in the short film Committed. Um, she got an award for that movie, which was Best Actress at the Boston Film Festival. Now, if you don't recognize Lana, if you haven't seen Curse of Aurora or you haven't seen Committed, you might recognize that voice because she's been featured in a number of video games, most notably, notably the character Ellie Holloway in Silent Hill Homecoming. That is so awesome to know that you are part of the Silent Hill universe for now and forever. Yeah. <laughs> um, before we talk about Curse of Aurora, what was it like? Is it, as, as an actress um, and a producer, is it different when you're going in to do vocal work as compared to doing a full-on you know, acting? Or, I, I hate to say it like that because you are acting when you're doing a vocal job. I'm not downplaying voiceover work. It's very right, hard. It's very right. difficult. I respect that. Yeah. But is it different than when you're going in and doing physical work on top of that? I mean, if, yeah, obviously, because you, you don't have to worry about, like, your body. And I think that that's something everybody is very conscious about. So, like, when, you, when you're on camera, you know, if you think about it too much, suddenly it's like, how do I stand? Like, I, you, it's like you sure. suddenly forget how to human, right? Um, and voiceover, you know, generally it's like, it just feels a little more, like, loose. Like, it doesn't matter what you do with your body. And with video games, like, in order to get, like, <laughs> exertion grunts and fighting sounds and things like that, like I'd be in the booth, like literally like hitting my stomach to like, uh, you know, like to get those sounds out. So, I mean, obviously I'm not gonna do that on screen. So you have right. to kind of find it and pretend a little bit more. I don't know, it's, they're, they're very different, but acting is acting, I think in, in both sure. cases. So. Yeah, and I did wanna, again, stress, I'm not downplaying voice acting or voiceover work. I know how hard that is guys. And I know how stressful that can be too. So please don't think I'm downplaying how hard people that do voice acting work. I know they work their asses off and we all appreciate it very much, especially video gamers like myself. I respect and love everything you guys do. Um, now, Mayron, I want to talk about you a little bit here. Director and writer, also directed several short films, music videos, commercial projects, including the award-winning short Committed. So you guys have worked together in the past, obviously before Curse of Aurora. Um, now, Curse of Aurora, however, that's your first major film debut as your feature film as a director and writer. Um, when it came to the direction and the writing, is it, do you think it's easier to be a director writer rather than just someone that's handed the script to direct because you kind of, as the writer, have what you want in mind the whole time as to uh, looking at someone else's vision and trying to direct that? You know, strangely enough, I almost feel like, I, 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 I have directed a couple of things that were written by someone else completely. And they've been relatively good experiences, but not as fulfilling as the things that I've written myself. Um, in those cases, as a director, I had a little bit of input in once I read the script, I was able to make minor changes, but the writers didn't really want much stuff changed, the writers or producers. Um, strangely enough, the stuff that I've written myself, I don't really have to do as much preparation as I would do for something that I wrote myself. Or, or, or something that someone else wrote, because when it when something when there is something that someone else wrote, I really need to dig into the script deeper and do more repetition of it for myself, so that I can memorize the scenes and know what the scenes are. As opposed to something I've written myself, I kind of more inherently know them, like I've absorbed them over probably months or or years. Right. So that part is is different. The other thing is depending on how much the writer or producers of something I haven't written. Um, how much they really want me to stick to it, it can limit the freedom that I have to make changes, the freedom I have to change the meaning of a particular scene here or there. So it's it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, yeah, I, I in terms of personal fulfillment, I prefer bringing to life things that came out of my mind. Absolutely. And I think that's something that all of us inherently want to do. This It's like our children, you know, Absolutely. once they're born, you want to make sure they're growing up to be the best possible people they can be. Mm -hmm. When you have a project that's come from your heart to your mind, to your fingers, to paper, you want it to be the best possible project that it can be. Right. So I completely understand and respect that as well. Um, right. Before we get into the reason why you're here, um, mm -hmm. you guys, did you meet on the, on Committed or did you guys know each other even before then? No. Uh, you mentioned you like video games. We met because yeah, of video games. Yeah, we both games. used to work in, in the video game industry. Um, Mehran was an environment artist for a long mm -hmm. time, and 
I came in uh, as a receptionist at first, just I needed a job. And um, then I ended up being like facilities coordinator. So I never actually did like any of the tech work. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we were working at this company and uh, he came up to me. He knew that I, I had a background. I majored in theater in college and I was you know, trying to sort of figure out what I was going to do. Like, you know, I really wanted to get involved in film. I've been writing uh, for a long time as well. So I kind of wanted to start writing and Maron uh, came to me and was like, I'm, he's like, I'm a filmmaker. He's like, you know, he's like, I see you've done some stuff. Like, do you, do you want to be in this movie, this short that I'm doing? And at the time I was actually not available to do that. So I had to kind of say, no, I can't, but you know, let's try to do something else soon. And then, um, I was also <laughs> a singer songwriter at the time, writing a lot of songs mm -hmm. and, and producing a lot of music. Um, and so we were like, let's do a music video and like make it really artsy and like see what we can put together with a small budget and like start kind of doing things that way. And it kind of just morphed from like, you know, like kind of doing music videos as almost like practice. I think it actually yeah. gave us like a lot of experience. Um, you know, yeah, there's kind of a music video we did. The big that. one we did was called Haunted Memories, which is like a horror theme thriller esque music video, which is available online. And then somebody Lana wrote and, and we wrote the script together and then I directed, yeah. But then we kind of, we, we like veered and we were like, let's let's get like serious with, you mm -hmm. know, so let's start with a sh with some short films. Let's, let's get our names out there and then let's move yeah. into hopefully yeah. getting, getting a feature made and figuring out how to fund that and all the fun of doing that. And so. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so with, with um, you two working together, do you, I, I don't want to spoil too much about Christopher Roar, but it is a literal bloodbath. Um, and something I want to bring up, Lana, it, throughout the movie, you are on a cane with a brace on your leg. Now, is that something that was for the movie or is that a real life incident that happened to your in your life? That was a real life incident that uh, was unfortunate. It happened uh, two three, days? three days before yeah. my flight to... Canada for shooting um and it's like I'm a big Halloween buff and I though this was right before COVID this was like the last Halloween before COVID and I, I do a really big party every year and I was setting up like decorations outside and I was by my pool I had set up like it was actually really cool it was like a pirate village around a pool with that like set lighting and everything it was very cinematic and I was taking pictures of it. Cause I, you know, before the party happens the next night, I want to get all the nice pictures of everything lit. And I took a step back and like forgot the pool was behind me. And I just like fell into the pool and I like twisted. And when I like stood up and I was laughing first, but when I stood up, I was like, oh no, like that's, that's a very bad feeling right now in my leg and went to the ER and yeah. Turns out that I, I tore my MCL and in the film, we say ACL just to make it a little bit different, but, but essentially I called Maron from the ER and I said, I think we're going to have to either, you know, either we, we call this off and we can't because we've already paid for everything, made reservations with people flying in, like there's no way, um, or we just write it in. And so let's just throw it in and Lena's got a cane. And I said, yeah, we both kind of agreed that that could make it a little bit scarier because mm -hmm it's winter, it's icy, and there's bad things happening, and you can't really go anywhere fast if you have a, a leg brace and a cane. So all of that was <laughs> was very painful, um, but we did it. <laughs> yeah, and it worked, and it does build that extra layer of suspense. Again, I don't want to get too spoilery here, but it does, like you said, it enhances that suspense in certain moments when you're outside, and you're walking, or you're running, and you can't hear people anymore. It builds that suspense of you can't get away as quickly or you can't get to help as quickly so right. it's that double-edged sword there um right. i think no, it, i think it's a good this. oh sorry i was just saying, i no, think go it's ahead. good it's a good um writing lesson to people which is basically take your characters and just do the worst thing you can to them and it will make it more interesting it will enhance enhance everything and you know we didn't have that in there and i think it really did enhance like we could have we written you're that about in to go act for the first time tear your mcl Nothing bad can happen if you just go and tear it and go for an audition. It'll, it'll be just fine. <laughs> um, and one last thing I want to say about the film, and I want to say this about um, Mehran and Lana as well. All their social media links are down here in the description. And so is a link so you can watch the film on Amazon Prime. Um, it is half found footage. Um, it's, it's found footage. Let, let's sure. leave it at that. Yeah. Um, 
and you get to watch how the footage was found as well. So there's a lot of fun that comes with this movie. There's a lot of scares that come with this movie. And I love the ending. I'm a big fan of the ending. So this is something that I really feel like you guys should check out. After this interview, make sure you're clicking the links down here in the description, following them on social media, and make sure you're watching the film because I promise you'll have a great time with it. Um, before we get into the reason why you guys are here, I'll start with you first this time, Mehran. Um, yeah. We know what you've, you've just done with Curse of Aurora. That premiered last year, correct? 2020? Uh, yes, 2020. Wait, I'm sorry. Uh, it premiered here in the States. Was it last year? I can't even remember. It was January. Well, it premiered in the States in 2021, but it premiered in Canada right. in 2020. That's right. Okay, that's what it was. Um, now, is there anything that you have coming up that you can talk about? I know that you got a lot of stuff that, you know, NDAs and stuff like that, but is there anything you're working on that you can talk about? Um, well, Lana and I actually are hard at work on sort of like a little past brainstorming stages of a sequel to Curse of Aurora. Um, we also have a couple of scripts that are done that are probably not ready to shoot. But um, we are indie filmmakers, and so the, the work of being an indie filmmaker is not just writing and making these movies. It's also putting together the people to produce the movies in one way or another, whether that's funding, whether that's personnel, whether that's anything else. So it is a large job as opposed to working for a big studio where there are departments that do these things. Mm -hmm. um, Lana and I actually worked on another film, which is, I don't know, to be determined, another feature film, which is actually a comedy mockumentary. And when we have information on when that's going to come out, we will let you know. Yeah. And then, Please let me know. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a, that should be a pretty big deal. We, it has, um, do, you got, do you watch uh, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Yeah, of course. So yeah. Greg Proops from Whose Line, um, Jeff Davis from Whose Jeff Line, Davis. Phil Lamar, who was in Pulp Fiction, but also was the voice of Samurai Jack and did like a whole right. bunch of other voices. He's in it. Um, Bruce Baum, well, Kim Canadian Whitley, Canadian Bruce Canadian Baum, 70s and 80s. David it's, Kepner. It's a really, is a fun really fun comedy mockumentary. Uh, yeah. And and we can't, we, we're, yes, unfortunately, we can't really say much about it right now, but that should be coming out like in the next six months ish. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited about it. And as soon as you guys have any information, please send it my way because I would love to be able to promote it. But guess yep. what, everybody watching? You don't have to wait for me because their links are down here in the description. I'm going to say it again. So make sure you're following them, not just because of what they've done, but because of what they're going to be doing. You're going to want to be a part of this. You're going to want to watch these things when they premiere in the world of film right now, especially with everything that's happened with COVID. We lean more on indie filmmakers and all the hard work that they do because the studios don't put out films as quickly as our indie filmmakers do. So make sure you're showing our indie filmmakers some love. Make sure you're giving them a follow and be ready for their next projects that are coming up because if they're anything like Curse of Aurora, especially that sequel, we're going to talk more about that when we're done filming. Um, if they're anything like that, you guys are going to have a great time with them. I'm so excited to be able to have this opportunity as my 201st episode with these beautiful people. So I want to get into the reason why we are here now. Uh, we are here to talk about what got you guys started in the horror world. Your first horror movie. Uh, Lana, I'll start with you. Your first horror movie was? Sleepaway Camp. <laughs> yes. What an amazing start to your horror world. And oh, my I wanna, God. I, I got to say this now just for the people that haven't seen it. There are going to be some major, major spoilers about Sleepaway Camp. <laughs> yeah. If you have not seen this movie, I recommend you pause this, go and watch it, and then come back. Because this movie, I'm going to talk a lot about this movie because it had a huge impact on my life. It blew my fucking mind the first time I seen this movie. So, uh, you guys, if you watch the channel, you know what this movie means to my wife and I. We've had whole episodes dedicated to this movie. So, I couldn't be any more excited to talk about it. And now we're going to go from one end of the spectrum to the next. Because, yes, this movie affected me and I loved it. But, Mayron, we're going to talk about your first horror movie as well. This one didn't hit as hard with me. It scared the dog piss out of me. So, <laughs> Mayron, your first horror movie was? Is The Exorcist. Like, not only the first one, but it really made the most, the most impact. Just scared the crap out of me to this day. It's one of those movies that even now, if I'm home alone, I won't turn it on. Right? I got, there's got to be people around for me to sit down and watch The Exorcist. And I don't know. Maybe it's... It probably has something to do with the way I was raised. I went to Catholic school for a while. Um, my mom was religious, you know, growing up, and my grandmother was. And so that stuff, it felt real. Like, it felt yeah. like, you know, you're going to something, you're, you're taking something away from that movie. And it's taking mm -hmm. something from you. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Uh, two things I'd like to share with you guys about The Exorcist. Repeat viewers, I'm so sorry you got to hear this again. One, I grew up in a video store and I was surrounded by videos all the time. And my parents, my job was to use the video rewinder when people were not kind enough to rewind when they brought their tapes back. And I had to rewind all the tapes. And if I did that at the end of the week, I got to take an NES game and a horror movie home. Well, my mother and I rented The Exorcist together. And that's the only movie that my mother ever shut off and was like, nope, Whoa. too scary. We're not doing it. And so I always had that stigma with me of, man, I got to watch this movie. I have to watch this movie. So I watched it and I was like, I did not have to watch that movie. I shouldn't <laughs> have watched that movie. And yep. another thing about The Exorcist that I love so much is the difference I feel watching that movie as a young boy as compared to watching it as the father of young ladies. The different scares I feel from watching it as a little boy that's like, fuck that girl, set the house on fire, get out of there. It's a demon. What are you guys <laughs> doing? <on> fire. Yeah. <laughs> to, to being a father and being like, that's my little girl. You know, obviously, as you know, I put myself in these films, of course. I, I have my little girl laying here on this bed and I can't help her. The only job I have left in this whole world, I can't do. And the fear that I get from that is just excruciating in my heart. Um, mm -hmm. So th this movie, I'm going to stick with you for a minute here, Mehran. Um, the Exorcist is a movie that I still feel to this day is not close to the best horror movie, but I feel like it's the scariest movie ever made. Um, do you remember how old probably. you were? This? Yeah, well, do you remember how old you were when you seen it? Honestly, I was probably way too young. I may have seen it at five years old. Like, and the reason is I have a couple of uncles that are big movie buffs, and one of them actually had a 16 millimeter projector. So before there were VHS players everywhere and VHS tapes, he had 16 millimeter film. At home, That's he's awesome. still a collector of, you know, he buys and sells films to this day. So growing up, we would watch lots of movies at his house. Like on the weekends, we'd go and he'd have Star Wars when nobody else could really see Star Wars or he'd have The Exorcist or Psycho is another really big one. Um, and so we would see movies that we shouldn't have. I remember seeing like an eight millimeter or 60 millimeter print of Night of the Living Dead. And I remember seeing The Exorcist. And it's like extra he's... creepy to see it eight millimeter. Oh, like yeah. Jeez. With yeah, I mean, like literally, we're hearing the sound of the projector. I still there's there's something strangely comforting about the sound of an actual old school projector to me. And uh, The Exorcist, you know, seeing those movies with my uncles, like I would, you know, when my uncles would watch me and my sister for the weekend, it would be horror film fest. Like that's what we watched the whole thing, even if we were freaking terrified. That's what we were watching. Yeah. That's what they wanted to watch. That's so awesome, man! I, I love your uncle. Like, <laughs> yeah, he just sounds he, he sounds like my yeah. type of people. So I, yeah. I like him very much. Yeah, you would you would like that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so Lana, we're gonna talk about Sleepaway Camp while we're here as well. Um yeah. now I'm sure that this is a movie, me watching it as a young boy, you watching it as a young lady. I'm sure this kind of took you by surprise a little bit and kind of made you question some things. Um, do you I, I gotta ask, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but I gotta ask you, which scene was it from Sleepaway Camp that affected you the most? <laughs> the final scene. I mean, that is the horror, right? Like, like, like you could, you could do like twenty more gruesome, bloody murders and showers in that movie, and the end would still win every time. Like, mm -hmm. I, I remember, like, you know, being scared, and and what's, you know, I think that movie was done. It was made in eighty three, which is actually before I was born. And I don't know if you recall. Well, you've seen it a bunch of times, but like the night scenes, a lot of the night scenes, it's like really weird like cinematography, you kind of can't see a lot, which I think right. makes it extra scary. It's like very grainy and dark and like things kind of like blur a little when the camera moves. And I remember feeling really scared, but of course it wasn't until that ending scene and that like that stinger and she's smiling and those teeth, she's got it away. The teeth just stuck with me. I mean, there's other things that stuck with me as well. But <laughs> Her, you know, I, I was so confused and I was in, I was uh, 10 years old, I think. Um, and it was a Halloween party that a friend of mine had. And it was her, her big brother, who was like a senior in high school, was like, he was in charge of renting the horror movie that the fifth graders were going to watch. Sure. And so he puts on sleepaway camp and, you know, doesn't tell us anything about it. And we're just a bunch of kids sitting there eating our popcorn, you know, in our, in our Halloween candy. And there's, you know, some making out going on or whatever. And then it's just like, what just happened? <laughs> like, I need mm -hmm. some therapy now. <laughs> like, and, and for those of you that don't know, Angela Baker, again, here's spoiler territory. 
and you're watching this whole movie as Angela Baker, who's played phenomenally, phenomenally, there we go, by Felissa Rose, someone that I'm a huge fan of. And um, at the end, you find out that she is actually her brother. Uh, the little girl had died in a boating accident at the beginning, and her aunt, the craziest lady in the world, Aunt Martha, raised Angela as a girl when really she's a boy. And you get the reveal at the end of the penis and everything, which you guys can't see because there's a Sledgehammer Horror logo on there. Thanks, YouTube. But it's one of those things where in a movie that is so fucked up, like so fucked up there again, I didn't understand it as a kid, but there's a part where a woman is killed Judy with a curling iron in her private area. Like that's how she's killed with a hot curling iron up the cooch. And you know, as a little boy, I'm like, what's going on? You see her hands and stuff. And I'm like, what's going on? My mom's like, ah, oh, she's uh okay. Uh, let's get to the penis part. <laughs> oh, so I mean, this is a movie that is extremely terrifying and, it's all trumped by that last moment, the last minute of the film. And like you said, Lana, with that face even. I know, <laughs> you know she's like, got this face and you can like see her teeth and, and it's sort of like dark, but you can kind of see like her body sort of in the moonlight and there's this big penis. And I'm just like, I don't know what's <laughs> happening, mommy, <laughs> you know? Mommy, I, there was a girl and she was exactly. smiling and a penis and what the fuck happened at that party? <laughs> I was not ready. We hadn't even gotten to that point in health class yet. I mean, come on. <laughs> see, I think that's what's so funny about it. And it's, it's terrifying if you watch a lot of the behind the scenes stuff from that movie. Because the guy that was doing that, they made a, at first they wanted um, Felissa to put a dildo on. And her mom immediately was like, fuck no. And parenting 101, <laughs> great job, Mrs. Rose. Yeah. But after that, the guy that did it came to set and he was crying and freaking out because he didn't want to do it. And they didn't know what they were going to do. And he finally agreed to put the mask on and do it. And I'm like, man, I can't even imagine. And nobody knows him. You know, nobody knows who he is. It's not like he's going to walk down the street and people are like, I seen your dick with Lisa Rose's face on it. Right. You know, like, it's, it's not like that, but just the, the, the humiliation he felt. And I'm sure there was, you know, it was back in 83, like you said. So there was that peer pressure. Of, Come on, man. You're already here. Let's get dick hanging. You know, like, mm -hmm. and it's such a traumatic incident, I'm sure, for that young man to have to yeah. go through. I don't know if he can watch it again. And well, real quick before we go ahead. Like, my mind is blown because now I get why the face is extra creepy at the end. It's a mask, right? You're saying it was a mask. Mm -hmm. So, like, yeah. it, it is so strange. It's like she didn't really look like that through the rest of the film, and now she just looks friggin' evil. And I'm like, but it was a strange, okay, so that makes sense. Now, I have to tell you, I saw this movie, right, at 10 years old, and I have not, <laughs> I have not tried watching <laughs> it again. So oh, you have to watch like, it again. I'm pulling from that, that, terrified mm -hmm. this is ptsd psd i can never get it right ptsd <laughs> there you go thank you right. uh it's too. like it's literally burned into my brain but I, I will say this before we bounce back to the exorcist i have this lovely blu-ray copy of this film look at that 4k <laughs> yes and here's what sucks about watching this movie in 4k there's a scene where you see the killer standing in the shadow of the doorway well, with the enhanced film, you could totally see that it's Cousin Ricky with a wig uh -huh. on, like they were trying to use as a red herring. Uh -huh. But because it's not the grainy VHS or 16 millimeter yeah. film, you can clearly see that it's Ricky. And it's like, oh, what are you doing? It wasn't even him. <laughs> mm -hmm. But with Felissa, she was 13 at the time of filming. So she couldn't be on set as much as a lot of the other actors and actresses, yeah. even the young ones were able to. Yeah. So this is a movie that, it, I would strongly recommend Lana if you get the chance to go back and rewatch this film well, because after it this, is. I'm definitely. Yeah, now yeah. I think I'm going to watch it also. I don't think I've seen that since. Oh, I was, Maron, you know, you're in for a treat. Although yeah. now you know, but. I, well, yeah, it's been, yeah. Yeah. And like I said, as a little boy, you know, I see this girl with a dick and I'm like, what the <laughs> hell's going on? Yeah. Like, yeah. What, what's happening here? My mom's like, oh, shit, let's go back to The Exorcist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And let's segue now to Mayron. Uh, what scene right. from The Exorcist was it that affected you the most? I mean, the scene when when the priest is talking to to Reagan and she's on the bed and she's sort of like channeling dead people. And at yeah. one point he looks at her and it's his mother, his dead mother. And she's saying to him, you know, like, greetings from hell. Your mother sucks, sucks cocks in hell. All of this. And, and like, the yeah. mother looking at this priest. And it's just, 
it's such a creepy, like there's so many levels of creepiness on there. It's talking to a dead relative. The idea that your dead relative is actually in hell. The idea that hell is real. The idea that yeah. this person is, is saying awful things to him, a person that he loved, like it, it hits on a lot of different levels and it's creepy. It is. And you have this point where Father Karras is, you, you're feeling, because you know throughout the movie that his mom, what's going on with his mom. Right. Like when he's running and you see that first Pazuzu, like there's a lot of okay. really down that comes with this movie. Oh, that, yeah. You know, as you watch it, there's certain scenes you start to remember that you forgot about. And there's certain things that the exorcist brings to you that mm -hmm. you just don't get nowadays with the psychological horror. Right. So to go back, even now, like I said, as an adult and rewatch, there's so many things that you're just like, wow, this is so terribly heartbreaking. Yeah, and it is. Yeah. It, it's such a sad movie and it's such a scary movie. And I mean, yeah, sure, there's little moments of levity in it. But man, it's it's a heavy movie, really, from start to finish. It really yeah. is. It really is. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, um, Lana, I'm gonna bounce back to you now. Um, this is gonna be kind of a hard question because I think we all know what the answer is gonna be. But when you think about sleepaway camp, <laughs> what is the first thing that pops into your head? Honestly, it's that it's that it's the face and the body. It's that that last shot that you know, like with the stinger, and it's I mean. That's the part that's still just ingrained in my soul. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I don't blame you because it's one of those things where the first time you see that, like, and it's been parodied a million times, Has you know, and a lot of people, seen any of the parodies. really, like, I, yeah. there's been so many different times where I've seen it in cartoons, like family guy type stuff. Oh, and I'm always like, oh, yeah. it's, it's Angela Baker. I see what you're, <laughs> I see what you're yeah. cooking with grease here. I get it. I love it. Um, and it's, it's sad that this movie does not get the credit that it deserves. And a lot of people have never even heard of Sleepaway Camp. And I think that Sleepaway Camp from front to back is a damn good slasher. And it's a oh, yeah. damn good camp slasher. Like, oh, yeah. And I'll tell you this, Mehran, um, one of the quotes I've probably said the most in my entire life as an insult comes from this movie. Oh. Okay. Um, you have a scene where they're out playing baseball. And one of the guys looks at Ricky and he's like, Eat shit and die, Ricky. And he's like, Eat shit and live, Bill. And <laughs> eat shit and live is something I've <laughs> said die, yeah. for the last 25 years to yeah, everybody that I could possibly say it to. Like, yeah, yeah, why don't you just go eat shit and live? That's way worse than dying because you have to taste it now. Yeah. So <laughs> Sleepaway Camp does these things to you. And I just absolutely adore the film so much. And it's, like I said, it's funny. Um, it's There's sad moments in it. Yeah. there's death there's it's bloody the kills in it are bloody really and bloody. that's why i'm bouncing back to you lana i don't know if you'll actually have because i know you said you only watched it the one time but as fans of horror kills are something that comes with the territory it's yeah. something that we love it's something that comes with the territory and we love it do you remember what kill it was that affected you the most from sleepaway camp well I did. I, I don't remember the curling rod thing that you mentioned. But I, I mean, so that's that sounds like that would be a winner if I could remember that. I'm gonna have to watch it again. But um, I there there was. I think maybe it might be like even the maybe the one of the first ones. I think it's like one of the counselors is taking a shower in the showers, or something. Yeah, and she ends up getting stabbed. Yeah, through the shower. Everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. I, the very first kill, then I think, impacted me. I mean, I was a kid, and you know, I grew you up watching it like this half the time. Yeah, well, you know, you know I, I was, yeah, I was trying not to look at some of the stuff, but I was also like, couldn't look away. You know, I didn't, mm -hmm. I hadn't been able to watch a lot of horror movies growing up. My parents were pretty strict about what we could watch, and so that was like, and it was just so, it was just so, yeah, so violent right from the very get go. So I think it was one of those, like, I can't, but I have to, you know? Right. Um, so yeah, right from the start. Yeah, I, and I agree with you. It's This is a movie that, like I said, it's, it is a whodunit throughout the movie. You really don't know what's going on. And then to figure out not only who done it, but who that who really is, there's yeah. so much wrapped into that. And like, that's, I guess, why, because they're just so messed up that they're just like a total, like, it's it's tragic, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, but every supervillain starts with some kind of tragedy. So absolutely. Um, so Mayron, I want to bounce back to you now. Um, yeah. we talked about the kill 
from Sleepaway Camp. But with you, I'm going to go a little different because The Exorcist really doesn't have a lot of that in there. Yeah. What scene, we know which one affected you the most, but mm -hmm. what would you say your favorite scene from The Exorcist is? Favorite scene from The Exorcist? <laughs> which is like, which grenade them. blowing up in your face yeah, would you like I mean, the most? I don't know if I could say there's a particular scene. I mean, I think the the climax where he finally... Where, where the priest finally figures out what it is that he has to do. And he effectively gets, um, what's, what's the name of the, of the, the demon? Bazuzu. Bazuzu, right. Um, you know, he gets it to jump into him and then he basically decides he's going to sacrifice himself. There's a lot to the structuring of that whole sequence. And then the fact that he literally jumps out and falls down those stairs, like it's this, He's, he's doing a good thing for the girl. He's effectively doing a good thing for the world. But there, and there's just so much self-sacrifice and there's so much tension and there's so much wrapped up into all of that, that it's, right. you know, it's, it's very, very good. So that The Exorcist is one of those movies where it's such an amazing movie that we often forget that it's a five film franchise. Um, right. Which I don't think I've seen all. I think I've seen only the first three. Yeah. I've never seen the four and five. I don't even. Yeah. Um, you had Exorcist the beginning and Exorcist, I think it's, uh, I can't remember what the last one's called, mm -hmm. but four and five are the exact same film, same actors, same everything. They just got cut different okay. because the first copy got set and they were like, what is this? We're not putting it's this literally out. literally the same film. Yeah. And then oh, like, wow. I mean, like, it's not, it, it is, but it isn't. There, there are okay. subtle differences, but mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing. But I will say this, in the Exorcist franchise, is the Exorcist your favorite in that whole franchise? Oh, I would think so. Yeah. I, like I say, I, I stopped watching at a certain, at like Exorcist 3, I think. But no, there, there's something, the thing about The Exorcist, like the first one is that it's actually just a really great film. Aside from yeah. the fact that it scares the shit out of me. Um, <laughs> even, even that music, that Something of the Bells theme. Like I yeah. remember as a kid, there was a commercial for, I think it was called Visions Cookware. And in the commercial, it was a glass pot. And I remember it was a glass pot and a typical pot. And in the commercial, the typical stainless steel pot sets on fire, but they're playing that music from The Exorcist in the background, that it's <laughs> something of the bell, the toll of the bells or something. And even that commercial creeped me out. Like, so the impact that movie had on me, like the fact that it's just such a well-told story um, is, would make it definitely my favorite. And it's, it's for me personally, I think that's, again, I'm a broken record. I think that's the scariest film ever made. Yeah. But I personally am a bigger fan of The Exorcist 3. I think The Exorcist 3, <laughs> is actually in my top 10 favorite movies of all time. It's either that supernatural wow. slasher. Um, you have Brad Dourif playing the Gemini killer, which he absolutely nails in that. And we get to see the aftermath of Father Karras, like what really happened after he jumped out that window. And that movie affected me in so many different ways. And I love it so much. And now, since we talked about yours as a franchise, I can't do that right now with Lana because Sleepaway Camp is a franchise, <laughs> but I know she's only seen the first one and she doesn't remember much of it. So I'm going to go scream on you guys here for a second. We oh. know what your favorite or your first horror movie was, but mm -hmm. Lana, I'm going to start with you. What's your favorite scary movie? Ew. What is your favorite horror movie of all time? Oh, God. Um, that's, that's a tough question. Uh, gosh, because there's so many really Right good now, Mayron's like, yes, I get to think this over before. Yeah, I have, I have a couple of, <laughs> I have like two or three. It'd be hard for me to pick a favorite for sure. Then you go first, Mayron. Okay, I'll go first. I mean, for me, in terms of my favorite, it's probably something by John Carpenter, either The Thing or Halloween, just mm -hmm. because they're, they're just so good. And then the, the third one might be Psycho, you know, um, Alfred Hitchcock Psycho. And, and again, all three of those are just flat out good movies that happen to be scary and that happen to be interesting and that happen to have moments that stick with me. I mean, The Thing is just such an amazing movie. Like the, the score is so great, the sense of isolation, the, 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 the not knowing what's going to happen. Like, and, and you're really put into the, into the viewpoint of each of the characters where all of them, like any one of us can be this thing. Like it's, yeah. so, it's so paranoia inducing. Like, I remember having nightmares about that movie, but that movie never scared me so much I couldn't watch it. Like, I appreciated the creature effects. I appreciated everything. It scared me, but it was fun. Kind of like Aliens in the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you just talked about practical effects. Um, yeah. I'm a big person on practical effects, and my top three practical effect films of all time in no order are The Thing, mm -hmm. A Nightmare on Elm Street, and mm -hmm. which is underappreciated in the practical oh, effects. Oh, such a great movie, area. yeah. 
And then my uh, probably my favorite of all time is American Werewolf in London. I have never oh, yeah. in my life mm-hmm. seen a werewolf cool. transfer. Uh, like yeah, there's just nothing great. like that. Mm-hmm. And you know, Landis killed it in that. And practical effects, it's it's an art. It really is an art more than it is sitting behind a computer. Again, I'm not smashing CGI. If you can mix your CGI with your practical effects, you can have something that's absolutely fucking beautiful. Of course. But with practical effects, you have someone that's putting their heart and soul and everything they have into what they're doing. Now, there are practical effects that are great. There are CGI effects that are great. There are effects where you have a found footage film and someone's getting cut right into their body. Mm-hmm. And you're just watching this unfold in front of you. And I mean, oh, yeah. that, that it looks amazing. And you can't tell the difference. So if right. you use things the right way, they can look absolutely beautiful. So, hey, if you guys had, don't know, Curse of Aurora is down here in the description. So make sure you're checking that out after this interview. Um, so, Lana, let's go back to you now. You've had some time to think it out, you cheater. Um, what well, is your favorite scary movie? Honestly, I watch a lot of scary movies. Um, I don't binge watch them, though. Like, I won't watch one scary movie like 20 times. Mm-hmm. But I have watched almost all of them. Like I sorry, I didn't mention like, Hereditary, and, which is also pretty much yeah. once it's like September first, we start mm-hmm. watching horror all the way until Halloween, and we do that every year. And I I don't really watch a lot of horror outside of it. Like that's just it's like two months of just all the horror I can have. Um, so I'm gonna go with probably the, the one that scared me the for like the for the most amount of days where I like couldn't sleep was The Ring. Um, oh, The Ring is so great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That movie. I still like. It, it became really popular after that film to to have like the girl with the hair in the face, and I know the that came girl. from like the 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 ring from was it Japan Ringu or was it Korea or Japan Ringu Japan, um, and it was such a really great like style, and then also that like almost like eight millimeter like weird like disjointed you know, mm-hmm. um, but that entire plot just like scared scared the bejesus out of me for and I was in college and I actually like cut cut class with a friend to go and see this movie and I regretted it because I because right. like, back in my dorm I felt so like unprotected and just like the girl is going to come out of my tv I know it you know <laughs> right. um and, and I've watched that one a few times and I just think it's a very well made film it's a great um, and your professor is sitting here right now like I fucking knew she cut class for that movie damn it <laughs> yeah I got uh, it proof now yeah Here's my acting professor, so you can say I was studying. There you right? go. Right? Like, I was, it was, uh, yeah. Um, and then I think that I also have, like, a really, like, fond place in my heart for Pet Cemetery, the 1980s hmm. version, um, because mm-hmm. I was, it was right around the same time I saw Sleepaway Camp, and I don't know, I just, it was scary, but I loved everything about it, and so, right. and I, and I love Stephen King, love, love, love mm-hmm. Stephen King, so... Um, yeah, I would say probably, probably those two. I have a lot of favorites. I love 28 Days oh. Later. It's so good. I just rewatched that and uh, like, it's just, it's really good. I, and I was reading the reviews that came out, you know, when it, it was released in 02. That was a long time ago. And it, it kind of got like shit on yeah. um, in the reviews. And I was like, my God, because I thought, because, you know, I'd watched all the Living Dead franchise and that was so different to me but it was being mm-hmm. criticized for actually they were saying it's not really anything special it's just that these zombies have rage instead of th- instead of eating grains so it's not that different and i was like no no it was it changed the concept of zombie yeah. when a zombie could like run at you and its sole purpose is just to like rapidly attack you and then the threat of this thing passing from one person to the next within seconds yeah like it still scares me it was just it was well done And how, three things I want to bring up real quick. One, how heartbreaking is it in 28 Days Later? One scene that fucks me up every time is you have the dad that makes it. He gets out. Then he looks up and a fucking blood drop to the eye gets him. Like that's so, you want to talk about brilliant writing? That's brilliant writing because he's made it. You know, these things didn't get him. He's won. And then the blood drop to the eye gets him. And you know right away, you're like, fuck. so fast and he's like, He's like trying to like keep his daughter away and he's getting more and more, you know, filled Mm -hmm. with rage and oh man. Yeah. It's well, it's really well done. Mm -hmm. And then I got to go back to something Mayron said real quick. Spoilers for hereditary coming in five, four, three, two, one. You've been warned the pool. We went and seen this in the cinema, my wife and I on opening night. Mm -hmm. And when that pool scene happened, 
I've never in my life felt the air get sucked out of a room as oh, yeah. quickly as it did during that scene. Um, nobody knew that was coming. And just all yeah. of a sudden, you know, you have anaphylactic, you know, she's out the window. Pop, and the whole theater was just, oh. you know, we just watched our final girl die right in front of us. I know. So, I mean, it's just, yeah. Yeah, you're just like, what? And it's a little girl. And then, right. you know, you you see T- Tony Collette's acting during the dinner scene oh, is some oh, of the geez. best acting I've ever seen, oh, ever. Man. And the fact that horror that gets shit on by these big award places yeah. sucks. Because you look at her in this movie, you look at Bill Hader in It Chapter 2, they were so deserving of award after award for the amazing performances they put into these movies. And for some reason, horror is just looked at as, you know, the bastard child of cinema mm-hmm. and God damn it. They didn't deliver on these performances, man. Like, I mean, and it's just, it's such a bummer that these movies so, get shit on. It's so amazing in hereditary. Like if you watch mm-hmm. it and it's, it's so rewatchable and you pick up on so many other things she's doing when she's not the main part of the scene, like look at her in the background and just watch just her. And it's mm-hmm. really impressive what's going on. And it's really, really great directing as well. Yeah. And yeah. one last, two more things I want to say. One about Hereditary. If you're one of the people in the movie theater that was going, fuck you. <laughs> you suck. I hate you. Because yeah. that was a pain in the ass. And I wanted to punch you in your face. Uh, I'm that guy in the movie theater that's like, look, man, I'm 35. My wife and I have been together since high school. It's been 16 years. We got three kids. I get one day a month to spend with this pretty lady and you kids are fucking it up. I got kids that fuck it up at home. I don't need kids fucking it up here. (laughs) So like that drives me my church right here. And I want to bounce back real quick. Something Lana said, you were talking about the ring. I double dog dare somebody to go out right now and find me a movie. That's not only as scary and influential, but just downright amazing as a PG 13 horror movie. Really? I don't even know. The Ring is a PG-13 horror movie. And the only PG-13 movie that comes to my mind that comes even close to that is Insidious. I think Insidious is right up there with The Ring when it comes to how scary and truly scary to the bone it is. But the first time I saw The Ring, I, I wouldn't have seen it in cinema. I you know, And yep. I walked out of that theater like, holy shit. Now, again, does The Ring hold up as well today? No. Because kids don't watch VHS tape. So the, the concept right. of a killer VHS tape is not as scary to a kid that would watch it today. Right. But right. for us old folks, you know, the get off my lawn generation, that shit is fucking scary. You know, the thought of, you know, and then who, which one of us, I mean, let's be honest here. I mean, it's, it's just us three here right now. <laughs> which one of us didn't watch that movie and then call a friend and go seven days and hang up the phone? <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that. You know, we'll we'll that we all landline know. phone. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Yeah, on a landline, about sitting sure. in the bathtub, wrapping it around your finger. Yeah, seven days. Seven days. <laughs> <laughs> so, I appreciate you guys coming on. This has been so much fun for me, and getting to learn how horror started for you guys, who I'm a huge fan of. I got one last question for each of you. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go back to your first horror movies, uh, Mehran being The Exorcist yep. and Lana being um, Sleepaway Camp. I'm pointing down to you guys. She's not down to you. Um, <laughs> And what we're going to do is we're going to rank these movies on a skull count. Zero skulls being the worst and five being the best. You can use half and quarter skulls, but here's the rub. We are not judging these. We're not being film critics. We're not judging them on score, acting, production, lighting, nothing like that. What we're doing right now is strictly judging these movies on what they mean to you and how much they affected you on the first time that you watched them. So Mm. I've always been a proponent of there's no such thing as the perfect movie besides Pee Wee's Big Adventure. So (laughs) I've never given, (laughs) right? One of my favorites of all time. It is. It's between Pee Wee's Big Adventure and Back to the Future. Those are as close to a perfect film as you can get. Yeah, absolutely. But when it comes to actually critiquing things, I've never given anything a five skull because in my opinion, there's always room for some sort of improvement. But Mm. when we're judging movies on what they mean to you or how much they affected you, that's the perfect time for something to actually be able to reach the five skull tier. That's why I do it that way. So, Mayron, I'm going to start with you with The Exorcist. Uh, zero to five skulls. What would your ranking of The Exorcist be, my friend? Uh, well, there's a couple of different things you said in there in terms of what it means to you versus versus these various things. So, in terms of what it means to me, you know, I'd probably put it somewhere three and a half skulls. But in terms of how much it impacted me and how much, like, I had a visceral reaction to it, it's like four and a half to five skulls because it literally is the scariest thing I ever saw. 
Um, but I probably would just settle. I'd give it a four skulls. Let's just say that's that. That's perfect. Yeah. Perfect. And it's funny because people are always like, oh, my first horror movie was so great. I have a friend of mine, and I'm not kidding with you guys. His first horror movie was A Nightmare on Elm Street. And after he had watched that film, mm-hmm. he absolutely refused to sleep with sheets on his bed because wow. he was scared that jail cell scene with J. Sue Garcia with Rod with the sheet oh, wrapping around his neck. He was so scared that that would really happen, that he just didn't watch horror movies for a long time and he wouldn't sleep with sheets on his bed. So, um, yeah. Lana, I'm going to bounce down to you now, or over to you, or however you guys watch this. Um, Sleepaway Camp, zero to five skulls, what would your ranking be? Oh, man. I mean, oh, man. I got to watch it again. And, and then I'll, <laughs> and I'll email you if it changes. I right. mean, I think in terms of 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 all the horror movies from the 80s it's you know i would give it probably like a two and a half Mm -hmm. but in terms of how much uh post-traumatic stress syndrome it gave me (laughs) (laughs) and the shock of it you know of that final scene which which is similar to what we did in curse of aurora we kind of held off really shock until the very end and i do like when horror movies do that so i would say because of how much it scared me and that how vivid that memory is i would I would bring it up to uh, 3.5, 4. 3.5. And I want you guys, I know you're already down in the descriptions to follow them on social media, as well as to watch Curse of Roar. But now when you go down there, you're also going to see what she gives this movie on her after ranking of watching it again. So make sure that you email me and let me know what how many skulls you give it on an after watch because you're going to see some cool kills. Night. That's yeah, a Friday I, night, man. I, I can't wait to hear from you. Um. And so, guys, again, thank you so much. And I know I sound like a broken record. Links, description, click, go. Now, episode's over. Um, I appreciate you guys so much for coming on here. Um, Don't go anywhere. I have a couple more questions for you guys. Everybody else, thank you so much for watching. It means the world to me. Stay what you are. Keep talking horror. And we'll see you guys soon.